So it's February 2nd. I'm uh, pretty excited today. It's sunny outside, so I decided to wear my fat guy Hawaiian shirt and my straw hat that I usually wear outside gardening. The sun is just beating down like a hammer right now, and I love it. I seeded uh, January 5th this year. That's about six weeks earlier than I've ever seeded anything. Uh, my mom, who has a green thumb, uh, she said that I seeded too early, but here's hoping she's wrong. Anyway, the best, uh, easiest advice I can give anybody to avoid leggy seedlings is to uh, try and hold off on planting. Uh, if you could plant a little bit later when the sun has got a little bit more stroke to it, that would definitely make it easier to grow your seedlings without them getting leggy. Uh, they'll have an easier time of it if the day lengths are longer. And, and usually I wait until about mid-February before I even start to seed anything. And then it's the end of February before things are even up. So. If you're just getting into gardening and you want to try and plant things early and you're not sure when to seed them, do a little bit of research. Um, find out what's going to work for you in your area. An example I'll give you is onions. Now a lot of people tell you to seed onions in, in January. Um, I've never seeded onions uh, before mid-March and I grow pretty good onions here. So, And again, I don't need to use artificial grow lights to grow my onions. So find out what when you can plant things and if you can hold off on planting um, that's what I would recommend that's the easiest thing to do to avoid leggy seedlings so yeah hold off on planting if you can but you're not gonna do that are you no I didn't think so anyway so if you really have to plant seedlings early um, I guess the rest of this video is for you then I just love this picture. These little seedlings growing out of this bottle look so cute. They look like little animals begging for food scraps or something like that, don't they? But the reality is, is that these plants are competing with each other for light and whoever can grow the fastest and get towards the light is going to succeed. Out in nature, plants compete with each other and if a plant senses that it's not getting its fair share of light, it's going to it's going to do its own thing. It's going to grow accordingly to try and uh, outgrow in height the other plants around it so that it can get its spot in the light. The reality is, is that if these cute little plants here could carry their own little machete, they would probably cut their partners apart in competition for the growing space. They would probably uh, spray each other with herbicide or something, give and have a chance. And that's the reality that the plants face in the world. Plants don't carry machetes or herbicide out in the world. Their uh, main evolved response, of course, is to grow very fast. And whichever plant reaches the lighted area first will survive. Unfortunately, if you've got a lack of light in your grow room, plants sense this lack of light in your grow room and they grow very fast for the same reason. They think they're trying to compete with other plants, I guess. Okay, so the main thing that gardeners can do now to avoid having your plants look like the one on the left is to provide adequate lighting in your grow room. So a lot of people like to grow their stuff in the basement. Uh, basement's often a handy place to set up grow lights and you don't have to worry about spilling dirt everywhere when you're repotting and seeding and stuff. My kids' room is the best room for me because it's a, the biggest south-facing window that I have in my house. A big advantage of, of a south-facing window is that your plants are going to get natural sunlight. You can see the sun is just beaming down on this. And you know what? When these little seedlings pop up like that and they're seeing direct sun, you don't have to worry about hardening them off when they, when they got to go outside. They'll take the full sun without burning when you go to set them free out in the garden or wherever you put them. So that's one of the main advantages of, of using a window is that the sun is the most powerful light and it's free. So you can see the window to the right and you can see the plants are leaning towards the window. So what you want to do is you want to rotate your plants. Some people say like quarter of a turn a day or whatever. But if you keep turning your plants, it'll uh, keep them straight. So what I'll do is I'll take and turn this tray around a little bit so they straighten back up. See in the background there some wrinkled up tin foil. Most people know this, but when you're setting up grow lights, tin foil is your friend. If you set it up as a background, it'll reflect your light and you'll get more light. It'll help you out to maximize the use of whatever grow lights you do happen to have set up. Okay, so in addition to the uh, south-facing window that I have, in the evenings when the sun goes down, well, in the late afternoons when the sun goes down, I have these 
three grow lights that I purchased in the late 1990s. I used to live in a shoebox apartment in Edmonton and we wanted to have lots of plants so I bought these they're called grow sticks they're meant to fasten to the wall. I don't know much about the light spectrum on these bulbs I would suspect they're a fairly full spectrum bulb. They're clearly advertised for growing plants. They were like twenty dollars a piece I think at the time but they're not costing me any money right now to set these up. There's a whole plethora of grow lights and light fixtures that you can buy. If you aren't fortunate enough to have a south facing window like I do, you're definitely going to need to have some pretty good grow lights set up for yourself, otherwise you are going to risk having leggy seedlings. So you can spend gobs of money on grow lights if you really want to. There's some amazing stuff out there. Gardening is a hobby, I guess. The type of grow lights that that work for you depend on uh, on your attitude uh, towards gardening and growing stuff. Quite often when I buy things I say well it's just a hobby right? I happen to have these bulbs and that's why I'm using them. If I was gonna purchase a grow light I'd probably purchase something with just a regular shop fixture like I have in my laundry room. Here you can see just a cheap shop fixture here. Nothing special about this. Full spectrum bulbs used to be quite expensive, but from what I understand, they've come down quite a bit in price. A full spectrum bulb in a regular light fixture like this, they say uh, can cover up to, um, one source said, 94% of natural sunlight. So if you can get 94% of the naturally occurring sun's spectrum in one of these light bulbs, that would certainly work well, I would think. At any rate, I won't uh, tell you what, what type of bulb that you should buy. You have to decide what's best for you, I guess. For myself, my preference would be fluorescent lights. I definitely wouldn't use incandescent. Uh, incandescents, they say, are pretty much only good for having the red part of the light spectrum, which is good for flowering. Fluorescent light, they say, puts out up to three times the in light intensity of an incandescent bulb. There are grow lights that get quite hot in addition. Fluorescent lights don't generally get hot. You can see I've got one plant already going to be touching the bulb there, but it won't fry that plant. And by not being hot, these bulbs would be, I think, a little bit safer too. They'd be less likely to cause a fire in your house. Most vegetables are... Uh a long day length requiring plant like 14 to 18 hours my view is is that 12 hours should be plenty so yeah these lights are only on for four hours a day from about 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. when it's dark outside and that increases my photo period actually I'm probably at more like 13 hours a day and if I didn't have the sunlight shining in my window, if I was doing this in my basement or a closet or something, I would have these lights on for 12 hours a day. So anyways, when it comes to grow lights, brighter is better. You just have to decide how much money you want to spend. The fluorescent lights you can see I've got set up here, they're very close to the plants. One of the main things that I, I could tell you is that the amount of light increases exponentially the closer you get to your lights and similarly it decreases exponentially as you get further away from your lights. So that's why I like the fluorescents. They're not very hot. With other bulbs you'd never be able to put your lights as close as these ones are to your plants. So make no mistake that is the most important factor in my mind is to uh, do your best to try and uh, provide enough light for your plants so that they're not desperately reaching and stretching and growing really fast trying to get to the light. If you do have inadequate light and your plants of course are they're just struggling to try and grow as fast and as tall as they can and one of the worst things you can do is over fertilize. If you fertilize your plants too much then that gives them what they need to grow really tall really fast and that's not what you want. Here's some of the things that I use when I, I seed my flats, my seedlings. See how much nutrients in this bag? 0 0.0, 0 0.01, 0, 0 0.0. There's next to no nutrients in this. This bag here doesn't even list the nutrients. The nutrient level isn't even listed on that one either. This is mostly what I use when I repot. <coughs> I talked to the local greenhouse and this is actually a blend that they use. Sunshine mix. Uh, has like 
a bunch of different types. I typically buy the type that has fertilizer in it. You can buy this stuff with no nutrients in it. Growers sometimes prefer to do that because with no nutrients in it, they, can, they know exactly how much nutrient they're giving their plants in a soluble solution or whatever it is that they use. If you go to the website for these guys that sell this stuff, the kind that has the nutrients in it, um, it's a very minimal nutrients, again, because they don't want leggy seedlings just like you and me. And their instructions are, uh, after a couple of weeks, they say to then use a weak, a weak fertilizer. For me, I don't fertilize typically. When I plant stuff in the seed flats, after two or three weeks, they're ready to be transplanted. When I repot from my uh, six packs into the three inch pots, well, guess what? They're getting a nutrient rejuvenation. I don't have to fertilize them because I'm adding fresh dirt that has this fertilizer in it. I've only ever got into trouble once. And that was like in May already when the plants were getting big and they really needed the nutrient. The sun, of course, is really long daylight hours. The longer the daylight hours, the more uh, fertilizer you can pump to your plants. They won't get leggy, right? So I got into trouble, so I bought this stuff and I added that and that helped my plants out. And what I would recommend is if you're going to be using this type of fertilizer, especially early on, mix it to like a half or a quarter of the dilution that they recommend. Just mix it very lightly. Uh, the, the younger your plants are and the less sunlight you have, the less fertilizer you want. So when you buy your seed starter, it's important to know how much nutrient, if any, is in it. If it doesn't come with nutrient, then you might want to fertilize. I typically buy the stuff that has some nutrient in it, and I don't have to worry about fertilizing generally. It's never been a problem until last year when I had some tomatoes turning purple due to a lack of phosphorus. And that's when I turned to the miracle Grow stuff. If you're buying soilless starter mix and it's got some nutrients already added to it and then you go ahead and add your whatever it is that you add, if you're adding this stuff here in addition to that you could find yourself in trouble. So less nutrients is better. You want your plants to have some nutrients uh, enough so that it can grow. If it has too much nutrient it is going to grow leggy fast. They call it a soilless mixture. It's generally uh, peat moss mixed with uh, vermiculite and perlite. Therefore, it doesn't have the, uh, the fungi and stuff that might cause your seedlings to damp off. So yeah, however you choose to fertilize, whether you use this miracle Grow or if you just rely on the nutrients in the store-bought mix, or if you use uh, compost or a solid fertilizer, you don't want to overdo it. I got some ready to use compost left from last year so when I'm uh, upsizing pots this year I think I may add this. Hopefully the nutrient value of this compost will be sufficient so that I won't have to rely on the miracle Grow this year. Here's a visitor to the yard. No doubt looking for some fresh grass. We've had some stellar weather here in January. And there's some actual green grass exposed for the little guy. I got some Brussels sprouts in the garden I think they're interested in as well. Having adequate light, of course, is the most important factor in growing your seedlings. Now, if you recall our little seedlings in the bottle there, uh, uh, scratching and clawing and trying to grow as tall as they can, as fast as they can. Naturally, of course, fertilizer would help them do that, so you want to control your fertilizer. The next thing that you want to do is you want to control the, the temperature in your growing area. Um, I use this, I use a heat mat to germinate stuff. Most plants require uh, a fairly warm temperature, high 20s, to germinate. Now, when you're reading your seed package, the germination temperature refers to the soil temperature, not the room that, the, that your plants are in. After my seeds germinate, I want to try and get them off the heat mat as quick, quick as possible. So plants that germinate uh, optimally at plus 28 degrees Celsius 
they might grow better at 15 degrees Celsius for actual growing. The trouble I have with my grow room is that um, this is my kids room and uh, I want my kids to be warm at night. This room gets pretty cold, right? To help my seedlings out here I try and lay off the heater if I can. So yeah, it's cooler at night in nature and I think that your grow room should be cooler at night too just for that for that reason. I tend to take a minimalist approach to this. I try and use the minimum that I can in, and yet still have some success. So um, I guess by not having a heater in your grow room, you're, you're uh, saving some money there and you're providing more optimal conditions for your plants. So if you were to set up a grow room and, and you set up a heater in your grow room thinking that your plants should be nice and warm, what would happen is that your plants would be nice and warm and remember they're trying to grow as fast and as tall as possible as quick as possible what's going to happen is exactly that that's what they're going to do so keep the temperature in your grow room low greenhouses don't keep their uh, greenhouses that warm at night and neither should we one of a few memories that stands out from my high school biology class the teacher asked a question, I think it was like biology 10, that was probably in grade 10. We were talking about plants, we were doing uh, the botany section of biology at the time. And one of the questions that he asked the class, and it was, uh, I guess when you're older you think of it, I, I would hope right away, but one of the questions he asked the class, and I remember it distinctly, is he asked the question, when trees are on the side of a mountain, why do they grow straight up? Why don't they grow straight out from the side of the mountain? And the answer is simple, really. It's gravity. If trees grew out the side of the mountain, well, they wouldn't be able to hang on to the side of the mountain, and they'd fall, and they couldn't grow there, period. So trees grow straight up so that they can hold themselves up because of gravity. My theory is, is that plants, if they're exposed to wind, they'll be able to deal with the wind when you put them outside. So because I got the fan on them, that'll make them bushy and the, th and the stems will be thicker and they'll be able to hold up to the winds and they'll be able to support the fruit that they bear too, hopefully. So anyway, I use a fan a few times a day. Some people will uh, lovingly caress their plants with their hands as they're in the area, as they're doing stuff. There are mechanical means to uh, brush your plants the effect is the same. It, it moves your plants around and it, and it makes them a little bit stockier. I had some peppers that were small, not like these ones. They were about this size when the big ones were this size. I put the fan on for a while and I forgot about the fan. And what had happened is it, it uh, a couple of them had weakened to the point where they had tipped over and kinked the stalk. So. If you're going to use a fan on seedlings this size, it's okay, they'll handle it, but do it for short durations. And one suggestion I would like to make is if you have a timer, use it on a timer. You get those little timers that go in 15 minute or half an hour increments. Set it up for your day and then you can forget about it. You don't have to keep coming in and turning on and turning off your fan. So if it's on a timer, it'll possibly save your seedlings from disaster. One thing I'd like to caution you is if you're going to use a fan right away, after your seedlings germinate. Be very careful. I had tomatoes last year that, that I had put the fan on on day one, right after they germinated. And the fan was only on a low, low speed and it was only on for an hour, but it flattened them. So what I ended up doing is I rewatered them and I put the clear plastic dome back on and they survived, luckily for me. So if you're gonna put a fan on, uh, especially the really young seedlings, do it for short periods of time. So again, this is where a timer would really come in handy. Besides making your plants sturdier, another uh, distinct advantage of using a fan like this is it dries up your plants, so your young seedlings are less susceptible to the, uh, to the most common cause of failure in seedlings, and that's damping off. And that's a fungus that grows right at the base of the stem where it meets the dirt and it causes your plant to rot and it tips over and dies. So by keeping the plants aerated like this, it reduces the chances of having your plants damp off. Drier plants are generally healthier plants.
I don't have a big insect problem, but any insects would be less likely to latch onto your plants too, or have more difficulty being established in this windy condition. So by being adapted to the wind, these plants will be less likely to tip over when I put them outside in the garden. I'll be preventing them from touching the ground, which will expose them to pests that are lurking around at ground level. Okay, so here it is exactly three weeks later after I seeded these peppers. And I know some of you are probably thinking right now, after all this stuff this guy just told me, why do his peppers look the way they do? I'd love to tell you that I uh, let my peppers get leggy on purpose so that I could do a demonstration as to how we can make it better, but I didn't. It all boils down to sheer laziness, really. I made a few mistakes. The first mistake, you see I have them nice and close to the grow lights there. Probably for the first week and a half of their little lives, they were too far away from the lights. And like I said, I'm only using these lights at the tail end of the day, which I could be using them in the morning as well. And you can see below the tray there now I've stacked up an inverted tray and some books and some styrofoam to bring the plants up closer. And the second thing that's wrong here is that you can see the sun beaming in the window there. This room gets pretty hot when the sun goes in. It's just like a magnifying glass or greenhouse, I guess, if you will. It's good for growth, but like I mentioned earlier, you want to uh, limit your growth a little bit. So for the first, again, week and a half, I guess, uh, it was getting quite hot in this room. So what I've decided to do is I've got a fan set up to blow some of the hot air out of this room during the sunny afternoons, and I blow it into the rest of the house. Another mistake I made, and this was just for a few days, maybe three or four days, and I left the heat mat under these things for an extra three or four days. And again, uh, that kind of takes away from having your plants cooler. So I guess if I would have taken the heat mat away in time, that would have helped. If I would have put the lights uh, low to the plants right away, that would have helped. And if I would have remembered to use the fan and uh, keep this room a little bit cooler, that would have helped. You can see to the right of my little contraption there, I've actually closed the blind. We don't need the sun blaring in on that side of the room just yet. When the sun uh, moves in the sky, I will adjust the blinds accordingly so that I only have the sunshine shining on the plants and hopefully not the rest of the room. It helps keep the room a little bit cooler. One other problem that I have with this room, and of course, like I mentioned, after your plants germinate, you wanna keep it cooler at night. They don't need to be warm at night. This room gets pretty cold at night and I don't want my babies to freeze, so I have this heater on. So what I've done now for the last week and a half or so is at night either me or my lovely bride takes the plants and, and removes them and puts them in a cooler part of the house to uh, spend the night so that my plants are cool and my children are warm. Okay, so a lot of you watching this video are probably saying to yourselves, okay, Savage, well, that's uh, good information there, but it's already too late. My, my stuff looks even worse than yours. So what am I going to do about it now? Depending on what you're growing, there are different techniques uh, to solve this problem. Now with tomatoes, a popular thing of course is that you can bury them up to their necks. They will grow roots from anywhere along the stem. They have these tiny little hairs. And they grow roots apparently from these hairs. Now peppers, you can bury them up to their necks as well. And obviously if you bury them, then, then that takes away the legginess right there. Peppers also have little hairs. I was looking closely. You could see the little peach fuzz hairs. It's not as pronounced as it is on tomatoes. But I would think that these peppers would grow from those hairs, just like tomatoes. I think these cells are pretty immature. I think they're, maybe I'm out to lunch here, but like stem cells which can develop into any cells. I think the older the stalk gets, the less likely it is to grow roots from there. But the big thing here with uh, transplanting peppers up to their necks is you want to do it when they're young like this. If you wait too long, uh, when the stalks become, uh, I guess, greener and uh, harder, when the stalks are more mature, they're, they're like a, a harder woody, the word is actually lignified, I guess. 
Lignin, I guess Lignin's tannins is part of wood. I never really looked it up, but anyway, it's called lignified. And if your pepper plants are too mature, then you can't bury them deeper. What'll happen is they'll start to rot. Incidentally, if you do decide to bury your tomato plants that are leggy up to their necks, strip off all your leaves that are gonna be below the dirt level. If you don't strip off the leaves, of course, the roots aren't gonna grow from the leaves. They're gonna grow from the stem. The leaves will start to rot under the dirt, and you don't want that to happen because the rot will spread to the stem and kill your plant, possibly. Okay, so here's a shot of the peppers after I've uh, repotted them. Buried them a little bit deeper. And I could have buried them quite a bit deeper yet. That one there I probably could have buried deeper. There. A little bit there. In the background there. But they're a lot better than they were. I really wish I would have transplanted these things a little bit deeper. But we're committed now so we'll see how it turns out. Okay, so burying your plants deeply is, is uh, one major technique of uh, dealing with leggy plants. Another way is by pruning, pinching off and pruning. Now whatever type of plant uh, you have that happens to be leggy, I guess it's important to, to uh, do a little bit of research on your own and find out uh, what the best technique for you to use would be. Some plants can't be buried as they'll start to rot. I don't know anything about flowers. If anybody's got any information on how to deal with uh, leggy flowers or any particular type of flower, uh, post it in the comments below. Google Plus has given us uh, infinite typing. So let's hear from all you experienced gardeners out there. Do you have any plants uh, you want to talk about? If you uh, know how to deal with a particular plant that's leggy, post a comment and let everybody know.